Namaste. Well, this is a kind of off-the-wall view, but I've been investigating the use of the MacGuffin in storytelling down through the ages. And, you know, the hero's journey and all that, the 12 different roles or 12 different stages or whatever it is. And this has become a formula, but it's derived from an ancient practice of these rituals accompanied by music, rhythmic drumming, chants, mantras, and so forth, which are still going on today, you know, in, in very much attenuated form compared to during the Vedic age when they were like, you know, public ceremonies to which everyone was invited. So these sacrifices, these great rituals have a heroic function in the society. They say that the heroic stature of our society is so great because we pursue the ultimate truth. And of course, everybody has their own definition of the ultimate truth or a different name for it or whatever. But this is in essence a MacGuffin. What is a MacGuffin? A MacGuffin is a storytelling element like a prop or a state to be attained, to be uh, discovered even by the protagonist, the hero. And in this type of story, there are always two very distinct and clear roles. The mage or the sage and the hero. The mage, of course, is the wise man who uh, mentors and guides the hero, who is the doer, the go-getter, who goes out and gets it. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever the MacGuffin is, he pursues it relentlessly until he gets it and brings it back for the welfare of the people. Now, this is key, because this is where it involves you and me. We are, of course, part of the people. Hoi paloi, right? So if a discovery or an economic boom or, uh, you know, a victory of some kind, a win in any field, advances our society, makes us more robust, uh, more anti-fragile, uh, better able to resist, you know, the changes in material life and times and all that. That's a win for all of us. So the key element that makes you want to root for the hero is that he's going after something that's going to benefit everybody, including you as a member of the audience. So you buy into it. You accept the, uh, what is it called? Suspension of reality. <laughs> <laughs> and you get involved in the story. You start to care about it. You start to feel it as if you were right there along with the, you know, participants, the characters. Because don't forget, it is a play. It is a script. I mean, look at every religion. They all have a MacGuffin. You know, with the Christians, it's salvation. Uh, with the Hindus, it's liberation. With the Advaitins, it's self-realization. With the Buddhists, it's nirvana, you know? Uh, you, you give it a new name and you describe the same old thing, maybe in different words or using a different type of logic. And it seems like a new discovery, right? But it's the same old thing. It's the MacGuffin. It's the undefined indefinable, essential thing that you must have to be a complete being. This is the aim of every religion, every society, every philosophy, every political theory, economic theory, you name it. The motivation behind all these developments is improving the lot of humanity, the condition of the human race. 
So in spiritual circles, of course, the emphasis is on development of character, development of intelligence, knowledge, the mind, meditation, control of the senses, and so forth, so on. All aiming at that prime experience, huh? that monistic cognition, <laughs> that gnosis, that plenary experience, that I am that. Tattvamasi, I am that Brahman. And because Brahman is everywhere and in everything, yes, we certainly are already that Brahman. But we don't realize it because it's covered over. Our intuitive knowledge is blocked by what? Our individuality, our ego, our desires, and our efforts to attain them. <laughs> this is the cosmic joke. Without desires, we would all be perfectly happy and live conflict-free lives <laughs> in a very easy, natural way huh? and be in good mental health at all times and so on like that. But we don't because we have these mental disturbances, these vrittis. Huh? Vrittis means mental modifications or shankaras, which is a Pali word used by the Buddha to mean like putting on makeup before an actor goes on stage. So we're all, you know, putting on these masks, these false faces, and going out on the stage of life and doing whatever it is we do, you know. But peace, happiness, and really a good life experience are all only within the purview of the self, the real self, not the false individual, but the real, that is the whole, that is known as consciousness, or more precisely, objectless self-awareness. That is to be realized. That is to be known. That is the message of the Upanishads. So when we come across any of these stories in any religion, know that the MacGuffin, the hidden, indescribable, unknowable, <laughs> utterly transcendental, unrelated, uh, partless, eternal oneness is not to be known in the sense of, I know this, I know that, because that's duality. That is word knowledge, vidya. But we want jnana, we want realized knowledge to know that I am Brahman, not just intellectually, but intuitively, to feel it. And this, the Panchadashi recommends, long sadhana to attain. And then finally, when sadhana is mature, you can just relax and the momentum of that sadhana will bring you into samadhi. What is key is the dropping of all effort. But that will only work after a sufficient background of pious credits and karmic, you know, good karmic, uh, has been accumulated. That could be lifetimes, depending on where you are, you know, on the scale. <laughs> and there is, believe me, there is a scale. And Maya is in charge of it. And she knows everyone's heart. There's no use hiding from her. If you still have desires, that's okay. There's a way to work them out, to act them out, uh, to be satisfied and receive their benefits within the framework of religious and spiritual advancement. And that's called Tantra. The broad name for it is Tantra. And that includes everything in life, every different department of human life, bar none. 
So everything is there in Tantra, but the aim of Tantra is transcendence. Transcendence of it all by the grace of the goddess. So by worshiping the goddess in everything, in every area of life, she becomes pleased. And out of being inclined towards compassion, towards her devotees, she gives access to that knowledge, that absolute knowledge, Brahma Vidya, that knowledge which reveals all other knowledge and makes it all make sense because it's the highest level ontology. That's why these states of consciousness given in the Upanishads form the foundation, you know, the rock solid <laughs> underbelly <laughs> of every authentic spiritual teaching. And the roles, the sage or mage and the hero, you know, the uh, wizard and the king, uh, the, uh, you know, Gandalf and uh, what's his name in the Lord of the Rings, you know. There is always a wise man in the background supporting the hero with some hidden truths, isn't it? And it's so in life as well. Everybody needs a guru. Everybody needs a teacher. Everybody needs a stable source of information that provides a complete worldview that explains everything totally logically and makes sense intuitively, experientially as well. So this is certainly the Advaita doctrine. You know, but it's not really about the doctrine. Even if you learn it, even if you can recite it, if you're not living it, well, what's the use of it? So we're saying that the doctrine or the philosophy advises renunciation, but not phony renunciation, not just external or surface renunciation, but a deep letting go of the desires that cause us to get entangled in the material thing in the first place. Huh? And that comes with knowledge, because through the knowledge of Brahman, we learn that this material world is always unsatisfactory. It always leads to suffering. And so, of course, we want to be free from suffering. So then we have to control the mind so that the desires are not suppressed, but seen as useless. <laughs> like, this is only going to get me in trouble. This is only going to bring me more suffering. Why do I need it? I don't. I can let it go. And this leads to a tremendous, like, inner relaxation and relief that, oh, I don't have to be running around every minute chasing all these desires. I can just live a simple, quiet life and, you know, not to be the CEO of anything. <laughs> and it's all right. I'm still the hero. But I'm the hero who got the Holy Grail, who found the Ark of the Covenant, and who came back and retired in his hometown. <laughs> Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>